Matthew Williams is a former investigator with the British government's Customs and Excise. After a personal UFO encounter in Wales in the early 1990s, he began to actively investigate the subject and focused his attention upon the links between secret government UFO projects and underground military bases in the UK. The former editor of Truth Seekers Review magazine, Williams has appeared on many British and overseas TV documentaries about UFOs. Please help us welcome Mr. Matthew Williams. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? One, two, three. Thank you. Just get, uh... Uh, so my name is Matthew Williams. Um, I, the introduction discussed a little bit about my background. Um, I was actually sacked from Customs and Excise because of my interest in UFOs. Um, I'm pretty glad that happened because uh, it freed me up to do a lot more research. So not everything negative um, like that, like being sacked because of your interest in a subject like UFOs has to be negative. Um, since that uh, time, I've managed to go on to do a lot more research into uh, UFOs and uh, digging out government documents, uh, some of which were in the British uh, government archives. And um, my interest in uh, crop circles has come to the fore as well, because I don't know if some of you are uh, aware, I uh, got arrested in 2000 for actually being one of the, the people that makes crop circles. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that, it's a, very, uh, it's a very big subject, and if anybody wants to talk to me about that afterwards, I'll be happy to uh, discuss that with you. Um, so my talk today is about Gary McKinnon. And Gary McKinnon is, uh, or has become very famous because of his arrest as being a, a hacker. Um, moreover, uh, somebody who was hacking, looking for UFO information. Um, it's already been discussed many times today, but uh, the Disclosure Project, which is um, something uh, spearheaded by Stephen Greer, where 200 or so very influential, very uh, uh, sort of well-qualified witnesses to uh, UFO uh, happenings in the military, uh, people who worked in the military, people who uh, had direct experience with UFO um, sort of reporting and uh, air traffic controllers, uh, not generally the types of people that you would um, want to dismiss or discount as perhaps uh, liars or, you know, people trying to gain some notoriety out of making up a story. These are very credible witnesses. Uh, 200 of them came together to actually state on the record that they had been involved in military projects to do with UFOs. Now, Gary McKinnon um, had had an interest in UFOs since it was dis disclosed by his father to him that he had actually seen a UFO and believed that he'd had uh, strange encounters with, in his dreams, it seemed, with um, extraterrestrials. And uh, Gary had kind of, since being a, a young lad, uh, this was in his teenage years, he was told this by his father, um, he, he sort of kept an interest in, in subjects of uh, UFOs. Uh, to the extent that, even though he hadn't read any books on UFOs, uh, because of what his father had told him, he decided to join the British UFO Research Association and um, he used to get their magazine newsletter, and he said that that was uh, the way that he, he got in first involved, was he couldn't afford to buy books at that age. You know, he was um, on a small pocket money sort of status, and uh, joining the British UFO Research Association to him was one way of keeping uh, track of what was going on with UFOs without having to spend a lot of money on hardback books. So. Um, going on from uh, there, I mean, he was basically, uh, I think we've got some slides here, so let's go on to number, number one. This is uh, Gary, uh, when he got arrested outside Bow Street Magistrates' Courts, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about his um, arrest and, and the hacking in a second, but um, uh, it's, it's fair to say Gary has a, a very strong, different-looking face, and he's been described as, as looking uh, like he's got a cat-like cat features. Uh, he has actually got quite strong bone structure to his face, and uh, it always kind of looks like he's smiling at you, you know, when you, when you sort of speak to him. So he's uh, an interesting-looking character. Um, but I am very interested in meeting people and, and getting an idea of their character, you know, where they're coming from. 
Um, and I had some experience. Uh, I spoke in the very first Las Vegas conference um, about a gentleman who's since become one of my best friends um, called Matthew Bevan. Now, he's another UFO hacker, so I'm going to take you um, to a photo of him later on. But um, my involvement with Matthew Bevan has taught me a lot about the, the sort of counterculture of hacking. Um, hackers are not really uh, your average sort of people that um, have standard jobs, you know, sort of nine to five jobs. They, they tend to be sort of uh, underground figures that um, may be a little bit anti-authority. Uh, Gary told me a lot of things that, that matched up with the type of character that Matthew Bevan was, in so much that um, when he was at school, uh, he, he didn't do academically too well, but he seemed to have a great skill with computers. So it seemed like that um, some of this might have come from uh, his, his being bullied and being a bit of a loner, that um, he, he sort of focused himself on his, his passion and his interest with computers and excelled in that, but he wasn't interested in many of the, the, the courses and classes that school had to offer, which didn't really relate to things he was interested in. Um, so. Uh, he was originally born in Glasgow, uh, hence the name McKinnon being the family name, but uh, moved down to London when his uh, mother uh, sort of remarried and uh, she came down with the stepfather and uh, his, his um, stepfather was from Falkirk, which is quite near Bonnybridge, and as I said, um, his interest started when uh, he, he was a child, you know, sort of, you know, in his teenage years, about 14 years of age. Um, because of his uh, father's UFO interest. Um, he was an, uh, an avid reader, so he'd read a lot of sci-fi. He was interested in Isaac Asimov and uh, uh, Harry Harrison books. And, you know, he had an interest in machinery, and he even d described himself as being interested in the military and uh, thought that he might even want to go in to be, you know, a soldier. He liked the idea of guns and tanks. Um, he was talked out of joining the police force by his parents, who said that he should try and get a real job um, before he decided to go in. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that was what his parents said, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I work for Customs and Excise, so I, I, I would agree that um, you have to be a t particular type of person to get on in these jobs, because uh, working inside the civil service, you know, you, you meet a particular breed of person who maybe has an idea to do this as a long-term job, and and uh, likes to work within uh, the confines of a, a regimented system. And uh, I was not somebody that wanted to work inside a regimented system, so I know how people can feel that that can restrict you sometimes. Um, and Gary being a little, bit, um, a little bit of a childish youth, liking a bit of fun, liking to mess around in school and not take his lessons too seriously, I think um, myself, Matthew Bevan, and Gary, we all have something in common, that we, we didn't conform to authoritarian rule. You know, we didn't sort of take uh, our sort of peers' advice to sort of settle down and do, and do the lessons in the way that we were told and think the things that we were told we had to think. So we've all got this anarchistical streak, you know, myself, Gary, and Matthew Bevan. Um, this is another photo of Gary. And uh, it's a, a composite photo that was used in a magazine. Um, so Gary's uh, upbringing may have led to his uh, not getting on well with uh, qualifications, although it didn't actually affect him in getting a job because his interest in computers, which started with um, uh, personal computers, um, sort of the 8-bit computers uh, such as the Atari, and uh, he started learning how to program by himself. So from his experience in learning how to program, he decided uh, that he would go in for a job. It was suggested by a few people he should go in for a job with computing. Uh, so through experience, simply as somebody who knows how to use a computer, he managed to get himself a job with a company that uh, upon occasions did in fact work with the military as a contractor. So he was installing Windows systems, which is nothing nothing too specialized, but um, he would be putting on uh, software onto machines and installing them in networks inside military systems and uh, private, co uh, private, private companies. Um, from his working his way up through this job, he managed to get himself a position as a system administrator, which if any of you are familiar, is, is kind of a high level position in terms of security of systems. So 
he was actually somebody who was in charge of stopping intrusions from outside, uh, outside sort of internet uh, sources, ways to get into systems. He was actually familiar with this himself. But um, boredness set in, and even though you know, he'd got a promotion and he was starting to become a little bit more uh, in a responsible role, um, when he would go home, on his own computer, which was then a 386 PC, which is archaic by today's standards, um, didn't have much in the way of color graphics and uh, um, sort of no flashy sort of internet access. It was all very textual orientated and uh, um, slow modems, very slow speeds for accessing. Um, he would go home from his job, which was as a system administrator, and he would start hacking. And he would spend his evenings, um, sometimes most, mostly throughout the middle of the night, actually looking into government systems. Now, he decided, um, whilst he was working in uh, one particular job, he did met somebody uh, who was a, uh, an interesting character, he said, who became his guru, his computer guru, who told him about a, a thing called the Disclosure Project. And the Disclosure Project, Gary wasn't aware at the time, he was informed by this person, was an effort by uh, Stephen Greer with these uh, many influential people inside the military who uh, had the status of uh, knowing about UFOs to go forward and, and look for evidence. He decided he was going to look for evidence on the computer systems that would uh, relate to UFOs. And he picked on a couple of um, specific areas, such as uh, Department of Defense. Um, there was a, a lady called Donna Hare um, who worked for NASA. She related a story where she said that a building called Building 8 at Johnson Space Center was known to her to have airbrushed out UFOs from photos. And that when NASA took satellite imagery, they would often have two folders on, on the machines that people worked. And these folders would relate to uh, the unprocessed photos with the air, airbrushing um, requirement to be done to take the photos out, and then the processed folders where the airbrushing had actually been carried out and the UFOs had been taken off the, the photos. And this had to be done as a matter of course before these photos could be released to any other body, such as universities or sold on. Um, now, Donna Hare giving this information, what Gary decided to do is he looked at the uh, videos and listened to the tape recordings of the Disclosure Project. Um, he wrote down notes, took notes of key areas that would be worthwhile looking into, and names of buildings, names of people, uh, general things that he could put in to search for on the internet. And this is how he made his, uh, his hacking approaches. Now, the method he used was um, one that he devised himself. Uh, it, there are lots of different hacking techniques out there, but he actually, because of his programming skill, programmed a little utility which worked to decide if a system that he had tunneled into, uh, if you like, logged, tried to log into, and this little system that he devised, a piece of code written in a, in a language called Perl, would go in very quickly and see whether or not certain passwords for the system had been uh, allocated for administrator level, which of course he knew about this stuff because of his work, um, whether the key level passwords had been set or whether they were actually in fact left blank. Now, he was able to get his little program to scan approximately, he said, 65,000 passwords for the system in eight minutes. So if there were potentially up to 65,000 entry points for a system, then he could scan them all. Now, this, he says, doesn't mean that there was necessarily 65,000 computers on the end, but it would certainly dial the numbers, as it were. Um, and if it got an answer, it would try his method of testing the passwords and then maybe be rejected or you know, carry on. But 65,000 is a very automated way of getting through to these uh, military systems and uh, different places. So it was quite, um, quite a powerful little tool that he devised. And what he discovered, quite surprisingly, but um, not so surprising to me because I knew Matthew Bevan and his attempts to, uh, to hack into the um, same types of systems, uh, was that a lot of these military systems are quite insecure. And that might come as a shock to some of you, but um, when you're dealing with uh, people and computers, there's often a, a big gulf of 
lack of knowledge of how computers work. And even though some people have uh, been given jobs as uh, you know, in charge of computers, they often don't realize that um, there is a, there's a large area around their computer that has to be dealt with in terms of security. And sometimes people just focus on their own machine or what they believe they know as the machines that are in use, and they forget that the systems can sometimes be set up to allow a whole range of access, which is not normally known about for systems administrators and uh, group administrators and this sort of stuff. So they don't set the passwords. And through the back doors into these systems, through these high-level entries, um, you can bypass some of the security procedures which would normally let one user only see these files and these users only be able to uh, write and amend to these files. When you have a systems administrator level access to a computer system, you basically own the system. And you can go and look anywhere you want and you can do anything you want. You can delete files. You can amend files. You can change times, dates on the uh, recording systems. Um, you can change the logs. You can alter logs for you know, the, the systems to show who's been logging on, who's been logging off. And you can also tunnel your way from the system that you're on back out to another system, which is like putting a, a transferring a call through a telephone system. And it anonymizes your um, presence because the systems you then tunnel out to appear to be where you're coming from, but they may not be your original location. So if one wants to hack into the military, for example, um, the technique that is used often by hackers is to go into a university system which uh, has low security, find blank passwords, and from that university system, tunnel sideways into a military system. Now, quite often, universities and people who work in universities will have uh, projects ongoing with the military. So when a military system sees uh, somebody coming in from a university system, it won't be seen as suspicious. If they were seen coming in from a, a, an outside source, like a dial-in telephone number, that would be seen as suspicious. So what you do is you kind of tunnel your way in from one unsecure system into a slightly secure system, and from that system, which happens to be military, you tunnel to a very sensitive military system. And of course, then you're going from military to military. So any procedures or security officers who might be watching the type of activities on their system wouldn't necessarily be alerted to the fact that um, an intrusion has taken place because you appear to be military to military. And uh, this, these are the types of techniques that are involved. But um, he focused on this story by Donna Hare. Donna Hare said she saw UFO photos uh, being airbrushed regularly at Building 8. He decided to go there. He tunneled his way in, he found an access uh, to the system, and through his interrogation of the, the description of the system, he was able to work out uh, from the comments which were left by uh, people who described what the systems were for and how, they, how the branches worked out to other systems, which was Building 8. And he went directly to Building 8, found some passwords empty, went into Building 8, called up the files, and he was immediately presented, he said, with what was processed and raw photographic folders. So he thought, well, this is interesting. This is kind of like what Donna Hare was saying, you know. Um, so he, he went into these, the obvious raw photo folder. And he was a little bit um, dismayed to see that the file sizes of the photos in this folder were about 200 megabytes. Now, at the time, that's, that's a pretty big folder. I'll explain to you. Um, if you have a digital camera and you take uh, a photo on high res, say about eight megapixels, um, that can sometimes work out to be about four megabytes of data. Now, if you're transferring four megabytes of data through a telephone, that could take you on a 56 dial-up, which is what he was using, that could take you maybe an hour or hour or you know, to, to get that um, information through. If the line isn't very good, you, know, you kind of could take a little bit longer. Um, to get 200 megs through might take a day or two days to transfer down a phone line. Also, um, Gary was aware that what he was looking at in these folders weren't standard JPEG images. They weren't the standard format that you would expect to see. So he was presented with a problem. How, did he, how would he look at these photos? How would he get them down over such a, a slow phone line um, in, in a reasonable amount of time and view them? So he had a bright idea. He thought, well, because I'm the systems administrator, I can do something clever here. I can install a piece of software onto the system, 
and activate it, which gives me remote control access of the machine. And by this, I mean the ability to actually point your mouse pointer around the screen, move it around, and operate that computer as if you are the user of that machine. So he installed into Windows this piece of software, and he used the machine itself to call up the photo onto the screen. And he turned the, the graphics color mode of his computer down to very basic colors, because the more colors you have, the, the, the slower it takes for these screens to refresh that you're looking at. Um, and he turned it down to a very low color, and then basically watched the, uh, the data from the remote machine coming down his screen, but at a reasonable speed, because he wasn't looking at a 200 megabyte file and trying to display that. He was looking at just one screen on a computer, one screen on that distant computer, and just looking at that small area of data um, zoomed down into one page. And as he was watching, he could see the outline of the, the planet Earth was in the, in the background, so he realized he was looking at some sort of satellite photography. And as the photo kept revealing itself and coming down, he saw an outline of a UFO, what appeared to be a, a, a sort of a strange object which had, uh, he said, uh, a sort of hexagon-type structure on it and didn't appear to have any rivets. It was very smooth, uh, didn't appear to be anything like you'd expect a normal satellite to look like. And, uh, he, he was, he was amazed by this and perplexed as, as the photo was displaying on the screen. And when the photo was just coming to the bottom of the screen, he thought, yeah, this is great. You know, this is exactly what I was looking for. And suddenly, instead of him controlling the mouse across the screen, somebody else started controlling the mouse. And he saw the mouse move down to the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and a disconnect uh, command was given, and suddenly, his screen went blank, and he was off the system. Now, he worked it out that he'd made a mistake, and the time he was actually operating the system must have been the wrong time, because he gets his time, he was getting his time zones confused. And he realized that what he must have been doing was operating the machine when there was somebody actually in the office. So they would have been seeing a photo coming up on their screen, and they're thinking, who the hell's doing this? this is, we didn't do this. And they're like, how do we get this? Stop it, you know? And it's like, you can imagine the ultimate thing. It'd be they turn the machine off. Um, now, up to that point, uh, Gary had been um, hacking around and looking about into Department of Defense machines, not really finding um, very much in most, most occasions, as you'd imagine, looking into people's uh, private document files, um, leaving messages on, on desktop, desktops of machines, you know, in WordPad. He would open a WordPad. Um, and he would leave a message saying, I was in your system. I, I kind of just letting you know you're insecure and this sort of stuff. So, you know, he was, he was kind of um, being a little bit playful with some of these uh, systems he was getting into and perhaps taking a little bit of a chance by exposing his presence there by doing this. But um, as time had got, got on, he'd got a little bit bored with um, his original sort of little, little hacks. And uh, like many hackers, they kind of... They, they either want to be acknowledged for what they're doing, you know, within the hacking community. They want to tell somebody what they're doing, or um, they, wa they want to sort of, you know, get some recognition for what they're doing. Um, he was starting to put messages about the Iraq war and how he thought that that was a bad thing on these systems. And eventually this may have um, led to his being tracked down and uh, eventually arrested and questioned by the uh, British police on behalf of the American authorities. Um, so... He did relate to seeing uh, some uh, documents, which uh, I'm very interested to know if anybody has an explanation for uh, one of the terms that was used in the, in the documents that Gary refers to. Because uh, he was looking through documents relating to uh, people's medical records, um, their arrest records. He was looking you know, through files that he shouldn't have been uh, looking. And he found references to ship names, which didn't appear to be part of the Navy fleet. And um, he also found references to something uh, termed as a non-terrestrial officer. Now, a non-terrestrial officer um, doesn't appear to be a term used by the, the Navy to describe anyone in the Navy. Now, I've not heard any rec recent explanations that can explain this. So if anybody knows what a non-terrestrial officer is, I'd be glad to hear from you if you could sort of tell me at the end of the, of the talk. But um, it's a very interesting thing. Um, are we dealing with somebody uh, who, who works on a ship? Well, not necessarily, because the term doesn't get used. 
for people that are working on ships, we don't think. So are we dealing with somebody who doesn't work on terra firma? You know, are we dealing with somebody who doesn't work maybe on planet Earth? I, I dare say, you know, simply as speculation, this doesn't prove anything, but the use of the term non-terrestrial officer might be in the future uh, a starting point for people to be looking for information inside uh, the, the military, perhaps with freedom of information, and we may get an answer to that one. So, um, Gary got arrested. He was um, woken up and uh, uh, had a, a, a sort of officer from the National Computer Crime Unit uh, standing at the end of his bed one morning and uh, asked him, are you Gary McKinnon? And he replied, yes. And he said, you're under arrest for hacking into uh, um, American computer systems. Gary wasn't entirely surprised because his, his attitude towards his hacking had become quite reckless. Um, he'd he'd uh, been going through some sort of stress with his, uh, with his relationship with his girlfriend. He'd been kind of you know, bored with the job that he was in. And um, he'd been smoking a lot of dope, he, he admitted, and uh, spending a lot of lights up late just hacking these systems for fun. Um, he would have his friends around, and he'd been kind of showing off to them, you know, look what I can do, I can hack this, and look, we can do this to these systems and leave messages on their desktops and, and whatnot. And, you know, when he, when he actually finally got arrested, um, he kind of thought, well, they finally caught up with me. They finally caught me, okay. And uh, he kind of thought that but that was um, a fair thing to have happen in, in respect of being caught. But what he didn't expect to happen was that... Um, after he'd admitted his guilt and um, he'd been put on no bail conditions and uh, things had kind of progressed to the point where it, he was either going to be um, prosecuted in a, in a UK court or he was going to uh, have the charges dropped as was uh, happened with Matthew Bevan because the American government are a little bit, um, a little bit worried about admitting to the, the populace in, in court proceedings how people hack their systems. Um, Matthew Bevan uh, actually held out on an innocent plea and was eventually released because the Americans didn't want to, re to reveal the techniques he used, which were actually a little bit more sophisticated than Gary McKinnon. Um, but it's an embarrassment to the military to actually show that quite important systems are actually left unsecured with no passwords. Um, I would say a, a risk and to bring this out in a court case is obviously going to be very embarrassing. So um, because the Americans refused to admit, in Matthew Bevan's case, uh, the details of how he'd actually performed the hacking procedures, because this would reveal another entry method that maybe couldn't be secured across the whole of the military within a reasonable time frame, they weren't prepared to reveal how he'd done it. So they actually um, couldn't extradite him at that time unless they proved to a British court with evidence how he'd done it. So the charges were dropped. So Gary McKinnon's case went into limbo because at the particular time that he, he committed the offense, uh, the same extradition laws were in, in force. So if the Americans had to go to court and they had to admit in, uh, in front of the p glare of the, the press and then lose the case, they would, uh, they would actually be exposing a technique which could be used and it would be very publicized. Um, so his case went into limbo. He was on uh, bail, but he didn't have any bail conditions. And then the law in the UK was changed via an agreement with um, Bush and Bla B Bush made with Blair. And uh, the law was changed to the extent that now British citizens could be extradited to the US without actually having to prove to a court the circumstances of the charges that were being made by the American authorities. So, um, this was in order to uh, speed up, they called it fast tracking of um, certain terrorist, uh, terrorist sus suspects that the Americans wanted to get in for questioning. And as you're all aware, um, situations now exist in the US where uh, people can be taken um, in the middle of the night, you know, from their homes. Uh, nobody uh, will be informed of, you know, why a person has been taken. Um, in fact, the Guantanamo Bay situation is, is very well publicized at the moment, but what uh, people don't realize is there are a lot of unacknowledged people in Guantanamo. I mean, there are a lot of people who are there 
and their details are not known. You know, their, their names and circumstances of their arrest are not known. And this is quite a, an alarming situation, I think, because um, uh, if, you, if you are arrested and uh, your family aren't able to, have, to, to know that you have been arrested, um, no details are given out and you're held indefinitely, um, perhaps tortured, this is quite a serious thing. Now, um, after the, 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 uh, the initial hacking arrest was in 2000, after the initial arrest, uh, Gary McKinnon thought, well, that's it, you know, it, it's all over, it's not going to get dealt with. And then suddenly when the law changed, um, he found out that um, the Americans also had the power to retrospectively claim rights for extradition over people that had committed offences or claimed they had committed offences um, many years previous. So they looked at Gary's case and they decided to uh, pull him in for extradition. And he's been fighting this through the, the courts. He's actually had, um, he failed in both of his uh, appeals um, because the law doesn't require that the Americans actually pr provide proof. They only have to provide um, a statement that you have committed an offense. They don't actually have to provide what is known as prima facie evidence. Uh, they just have to state that you have committed an offense and they can pull you out from the UK. Now, this is peculiar only to the United Kingdom. And it doesn't go, the, the, the agreement which goes between the US and the UK doesn't go both ways. So, for instance, the UK could not come and say, we wish to have this person taken back to the UK for charges that we say that you have done. We can't do it. We can't pull you back to us. But America can pull a British citizen across to the US. And no other European countries have agreed to this. And the laws are still in place for people to you know, be protected by their own country uh, in respect of not being taken without evidence being given for extradition. Um, this is being challenged now in the House of, uh, House of Lords and House of Commons by a number of uh, Conservative MPs who are quite worried that this represents a problem to, uh, to the rights of British people. You're probably aware of uh, the uh, NatWest 3. Um, these are a couple of people that have been taken over under this, uh, th this proviso, whereby um, the charges uh, have been laid in very basic terms and uh, nobody is Nobody is saying that these people are yet going to be um, tried, but they are on bail, and they, they have to be in the U.S. under uh, uh, sort of um, tagged conditions. And uh, basically, if you look at um, hacking cases, uh, there's another one called, uh, there's another guy called Kevin Mitnick, and he's another hacker, but he was U.S.-based. In his case, um, he hacked into computer systems uh, in a rather fraudulent manner, and he was placed in uh, custody for five years without a trial. The last eight months of his custodial uh, sort of term without a trial was eight months in solitary confinement. And then the authorities decided that they weren't actually going to try him and they let him go. So basically what you have is, is a situation in the US now which is quite dangerous whereby anyone who goes against the authorities or upsets the, you know, upsets the uh, state of national security in some way um, can be just held indefinitely without trial. And this is the, this is the st situation that you have got in this country at the moment. And, and I would say that this goes well against the liberties of um, all of you and needs to be looked at. And um, so Gary McKinnon uh, has now stopped his hacking. He's uh, become very, uh, very much a rec reclusive character on his bail conditions, which have been set by the, uh, set by the US, um, he, in the UK, until his extradition is, um, is completed, and if he does get taken to the US, uh, he has to stay um, within a certain, uh, certain area. He, he's not allowed to have, um, uh, he's not allowed to travel abroad. He's not allowed to um, use a computer. He's not allowed to use a mobile phone if the mobile phone can actually access the internet and he has to report himself into a police station every single night. And this is before any trial and before any extradition, and he's, he's become quite worried by what could happen to him if he comes to the US now, because the, the law is such that if he was to come to the US, there's no guarantee he's gonna get a trial, that he may just be put in suspended, and it's like a suspended state in a, in a jail, and 
be there for a very long time. He could even go to Guantanamo Bay. And with the current security state in the US, maybe they would want to make an example of Gary McKinnon. And they would want to say that um, the damage that he's caused would be uh, such that he deserves to go to Guantanamo and be tortured. You know, we don't know. It's been suggested because um, certain correspondences have been made between the uh, UK and US authorities that they're pushing for 70 years for Gary. So if he does come to the US, they're going to push for 70 years. Um, a number of claims have been made about how much damage Gary did, which I think are unreasonable from what I've heard of, of how the, the systems were actually accessed. Um, what Gary did was not exactly destroying systems. Um, he, was, he was maybe leaving messages on the systems. He was interrogating them and moving around. But it was all basically um, looking, looking rather than destroying computer systems. So um, in order to be able to justify the 70 years that um, the Americans are, are touting around at the moment, they had to say that the, each computer that they allege was damaged was worth 5,000 pounds. Uh, sorry, $5,000 of, of uh, repair costs. So um, prior to the extradition, um, nothing had been mentioned along the lines of how much damage had been done. But uh, the extradition uh, taking place, suddenly this figure of $5,000 per computer was, was put around. And that just happens to be the exact amount that you need in order to uh, make this a, a, criminal, a criminal case, apparently. So. Um, also was alleged that um, due to Gary's activities, which, as I say, were not destructive or not um, in any way designed to uh, ruin a computer system or take a computer system down, um, a story came out, which is now alleged um, by the Americans, that uh, Gary's activities took down the, the uh, military district of Washington uh, completely. The entire computer system of the military dis of district of Washington was disabled by Gary's activities, which doesn't seem to be reasonable. But what you have is um, the same thing happened to Matthew Bevan. Um, Matthew Bevan did, in fact, do some stuff which could be considered a lot more of a threat than Gary McKinnon, because he actually hacked into the nuclear launch systems of um, uh, some bases and uh, got full administrator access level to computers that were, in fact, in charge of nuclear missiles. Um, uh, he was looking for UFO information. Uh, he actually got a lot of um, information relating to uh, UFOs from the systems. Uh, most of that information was on his computer systems, which were seized by the police and subsequently lost. Uh, but he says that um, from his looking into uh, computers he, the, within the military and um, secret, uh, secret areas of the military, he was able to find information relating to anti-gravity and a heavy element fuel source which was being experimented upon by the military. And I find that kind of interesting because it's been mentioned a few times this weekend and the, the, the theme of the conference is um, that some of these technologies could in fact uh, help the planet and uh, reduce fuel costs, re reduce energy costs and uh, provide possibly free energy sources. Now, recently I've been aware of um, Three scientists working in the free energy field, um, Stan Mayer uh, being, being one of them that I've been looking at most recently, uh, who is alleged, you know, the three scientists have been recently killed. Stan Mayer um, was, the, was, the, uh, was the most recent. And um, there are a lot of interests that want to stop this information coming out. Um, if you Think of this in, in terms of UFOs. Maybe uh, the information could be too much, as I said last night um, in responses. Uh, the information, some people would think, would be too much you know, for public dissemination. But I think what you've actually got is cartels of petrol and energy companies that make a lot of money out of keeping the world the way it is and keeping us tied into driving cars and spending a lot of money. Um, increasing fuel costs, and what you've basically got with these free energy systems, not only have we got new ways of uh, being able to fly, um, we've got new ways of being able to heat our homes, and to do it from simple substances such as water. And if you 
can just basically go out and take snow or seawater and put this into a machine, you can get enough hydrogen out of these machines to provide plenty of um, heat and plenty of electricity and usable power for vehicles. And many of these experimental vehicles, such as water cars, have been created. This is the type of stuff that they're trying to stop. And in addition, anti-gravity engines, this, this type of technology is something they do not want the, the public to have because it would take all the control away from the infrastructures of um, petrol companies and governments to control taxes and put all the power that was with these companies and with these governments now in your hands because all you have to have is the device that can provide you the energy and you don't need them anymore. You don't need these controlling mechanisms in your life anymore and you could be liberated and free to drive your car for as long as the tires would basically go for and there's going to be more control over giving you tires than there is going to be giving you water. Um, you, could, you could heat your house for free. This is what they want to stop and I think this is really why the, the, the cover-up is there is because of control mechanisms really more than anything else to keep us in our place and people like Gary McKinnon, Matthew Bevan, Kevin Mitnick, they are the new, uh, the new pioneers of uh, computer technology. They're the new sort of the new, the new school that are able to actually get around the systems that people quite often think are secure, um, which are in fact quite insecure. And this highlights the the problem we have with uh, terrorists actually doing the same thing, and perhaps for um, less honorable or um, altruistic reasons than some of these hackers. But I believe that um, the American government will try and make an example of these hackers like Gary McKinnon in order to frighten off the uh, other potential threats that may hack into their systems. Gary McKinnon said whilst he was hacking, he did see many other hackers on these systems whilst he was there from different countries of the world. And, and by the techniques they were using, he was able to in, interpret their activities as being those of hackers. So other people were trying to hack the systems at the same time he was hacking the systems and he was able to, to see this. And I put it to you that um, this is actually a problem which needs to be addressed by all governments of the world really is the security of these systems because if people like school kids like Matthew Bevan or you know uh, pe people like Gary McKinnon um, can do this on home computers with dial-in modems, and they were doing this quite a few years ago. If they could do this from home computers in their bedrooms, and they could get access to sensitive information, um, what, a, what could a terrorist do? And this is a problem. It needs to be addressed. And the way that we think things are going with the security systems, it appears from Matthew Bevan, um, and he, he's still in touch with a lot of the hacker community, that a lot of the systems that he and Gary McKinnon hacked into are still as insecure as they were back then. Not many of the uh, systems have been plugged. Gary McKinnon says the NASA system was plugged, but many of the other systems have not been, and many military systems still exist that you can just get into as easily as they did. And this is a problem. And rather than fix the problem or admit that there really is a problem, the focus is that the hackers are the problem. Now, I put it to you that actually the hackers are doing a valuable service in highlighting the fact that these problems exist so that the military have at least have a chance to do something about this and secure these systems. And if they can't secure them, maybe they should take these systems off the Internet. Maybe they shouldn't be accessible from the Internet. But a lot of these systems, surprisingly, you might find it you know, hard to believe, but a lot of these sensitive systems are available on the Internet. And even though some of the information may be cryptographically altered so that it would make it hard for the end user to decrypt that information, systems could exist that would decrypt that information. And it's through the standard internet. If you know where to go and you know which numbers to type in and you can get through their doorways, you can access this information from your home computer. And you would imagine that not to be the case, but it really is the case. And if we're living in the world that we're told we're supposed to be living in, where we're at threat from terrorists, if they can get access to these, if, if they can get access to nuclear launch codes and nuclear launch systems, and if they can get access to things that are going to cause harm, I think they would do that. So I think the military need to buck up their ideas, and maybe uh, hackers like Gary McKinnon should not be 
used as the, the target of attack by the government. They should actually be, in some way, maybe punished, but not, um, maybe not extradited and tortured or given 70 years uh, jail sentence. Um, a figure of one and a half million pounds, uh, one and a half million dollars, sorry, I keep on working in pounds, um, has been put across as, a, as a, a potential fine for Gary McKinnon. Where would somebody who happens to be serving a jail sentence in an American jail, maybe like Guantanamo, where are they going to get the money to pay that fine? Where are they going to get it? Are they getting pocket money from the, the, the jail? Are they, are they like going to allow them to make McDonald's, you know, McDonald's packaging or something, at, you know, a couple of cents a throw, and how many years would they have to work off one and a half million dollars? It's completely unreasonable. And I don't think the American system takes into account, you know, the, the, these certain things, that um, some of their, their fines are a little bit excessive and uh, unreasonable. So, um, in speaking to Gary, I think... Um, my, my idea has come up that um, he, he should maybe work towards getting uh, the authorities to acknowledge their problems and work with them. Um, this would be, I feel, a much more fitting uh, punishment than to simply put somebody, when, somebody in a jail and, and, uh, and almost throw away the key. Um, if hackers exist and hackers are prepared to reveal their techniques as hackers quite often appear to want to do. They want to reveal their techniques so that other people can see where these security vulnerabilities lie. That it's irresponsible of the American military and the British military and all other governments to ignore these hackers in what they're saying. They should embrace what the hackers are trying to tell them. They should take it on board and maybe they should, in some limited way, work with the hackers and, thank you, thanks, uh, work with the hackers. This to me seems responsible. And the current state that we have where um, no real communications and no real deal playing and, and anything has gone on, simply threats have been made, extradition orders have been um, put into the pipe, pipeline, and this is not the way to go. The Americans need to look at this very seriously. Um, I think we stand at, the, at this time, I personally believe that we do stand in a, um, a time where we could see nuclear nuclear weapons perhaps used on cities, major cities in the United Kingdom and the US if the terrorists get their hands on them. So we do stand in dangerous times and we, need to, we do need to be vigilant. I don't think we need to lose all our freedoms to be vigilant. Um, I don't think many of us are actually um, the ones that need to be uh, scrutinized and looked at. Um, you know, we need to work together to find solutions to this, and I think the hackers need to work with us, and uh, maybe we can find uh, a way through these dark and uh, interesting times. Okay. Uh, so Gary wasn't able to recall uh, details of the uh, names of the ships. It was a question I asked, but um, there's, a, there's a lot that's gone from his memory because it actually happened back in 2000, you know, and uh, he, he used to do these things in the middle of the night, and, and he didn't have a lot of it uh, stored on his system, which has been, in all fairness, a lot of people have actually claimed that um, Gary doesn't seem like a credible hacker. Um, but the point is, I mean, the American authorities seem to think he's a credible hacker. Um, they've actually claimed that he's hacked their systems in many various ways from Air Force, Navy, um, Army, Department of Defense, Pentagon, NASA. These are all places that they are listing as uh, things that he's hacked. So obviously he has been in to these systems and he has seen things. And right from day one, he's always claimed that his interest has been the UFO angle. And um, the things, that the, the key elements of things he saw, he remembers certain features of them, but uh, he, didn't, he didn't get a photograph, uh, a screen capture is another thing that people say, of the UFO. You know, the why didn't he capture the screen? And his explanation is that he, uh, he simply didn't have time to do it. And it was the only time he'd seen that, that that type of image was uh, when he got disconnected. And if he'd had the time to do it, he would have, but that's not information he, he's able to relate to me as the names of these ships. He hasn't related that information to me either. I did, I did ask him on a number of occasions, you know, if he had that sort of information. Um, I do believe he is a credible hacker. He does, he does um, come across to me as the hacker type. Um, and certainly, I, I do believe, uh, because of his interest with uh, Stephen Greer 
um, and the disclosure project, and uh, he, he really is, you know, he's the real deal. But um, in terms of his actually coming forward with evidence, uh, not, not anything other than his testimony, unfortunately. But there is an, uh, there's an opening for other people to go and try and gather this, the same information um, if, they, if they wish to try and do this, but um, at, at your own peril. Um, hacking is, uh, is a quite a serious charge, and uh, you know, 70 years is, uh, is perhaps something that would make people think again, but there are many hackers out there that uh, seem to do this without um, getting caught. So, okay, should we um, just have a little piece of video of Gary? I think we can go to the screen. I was in search of suppressed technology, um, you know, referred to as UFO technology. I think it's the biggest kept secret in the world because of its comic value. Um, but it's a very important thing. We've got old age pensioners can't pay their fuel bills. Um, we've got countries being invaded um, to get award oil contracts to the West. And uh, meanwhile, secretive parts of the secret government are sitting on uh, suppressed technology for free energy. So how did you go about trying to find the stuff that you were looking for in NASA, in the Department of Defense? Well, I assumed that although it's part of a secret government project, there must be military ties. Um, I'd read 400, 400 expert and witness testimonies, um, ranging from civilian air traffic controllers through military radar operators, all the way up to guys that were in charge of whether or not to launch nuclear missiles. So it's a very credible people. Uh, all of these people had said uh, that there, is, there are UFOs, they are alien. Um, we're using anti-gravity and reverse engineered technology that came from captured UFO craft. We're using anti-gravity? Yeah. Right now? Who, who's using anti-gravity? Um, secret compartmented parts of the government. And uh, I think we're being trickle-fed um, by the various defence contractors so that I think, I predict within the next seven years we will have anti-gravity as a public, uh, a publicly usable phenomenon. Okay, so how did you go about hacking into the computers to find what you were looking for? Well, unlike the press would have you believe, it wasn't very clever. Um, I searched for blank passwords. Um, I wrote a tiny Perl script, the Perl language, that tied together other people's programs that searched for blank passwords. So you could scan 65,000 machines in just over eight minutes. So you went and actually accessed... 65,000 machines sitting on, I guess, 65,000 well, desks in different buildings? Um, no, because all 65,000 aren't necessarily live yet. You might find typically 5,000 might be live. And out of that, 500 might be Windows machines, then 50 might have blank administrator passwords, which is a pretty bad ratio for the world's largest military. So you're saying that you found computers which had a high-ranking status, administrator status, yep. which hadn't had their passwords set. They were still set to default. Yeah, precisely. Okay, I think we better leave it there because uh, that's about the time I've got for my talk. So, does anybody have any questions? This one might have to be the last one, is it? Oh, we've got five minutes. Okay. Sure. I've heard airbrushing out, you know, UFOs and, and government agencies airbrushing out UFOs. Do you have any other corroborating evidence of that? Um, well, speaking specifically on the Gary McKinnon case, what I, what I find is interesting, um, as Gary says himself, is that um, what he was told would be at Johnson Space Center Building 8 by Donna Hare via the disclosures made in the disclosure project, that's what he found. That's exactly what he found. So, it appears that if you do follow up the leads, if you do follow the, the, the trail, the paper trail, requesting freedom of information documents, or even if you go to rather unconventional and dangerous techniques such as hacking, that you may find the information you're looking for that corroborates this. But I would suggest if you do it, um, don't do what Gary did and uh, don't not save it to your hard drive. <laughs> if you're going to do this, find some way of taking, keep a camera next to your PC and if necessary, take a photo of the screen, you know. Don't, don't rely on image capture software and, and the, you know what computers are like, you'll go, there's a UFO on my screen and it'll go, sorry, Windows error, can't save. And you'll go, just get a camera, you know, anything you can to, to record this information. And um, if possible, um, provide some way of showing that with, with um, the types of connection that you've got, that you were in these systems, you know, that, that you were there. But 
whoever you release that to, be careful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go openly yourself and, and reveal that you've done this because you might get charged by the military. But ultimately, as Gary says himself, um, corroborative evidence, uh, it's his testimony only. But his testimony is enough saying that he hacked these systems to get him put in prison. So surely, if he's, if he's able to hack these systems, he's caused the, the stir that he's caused. If he says he saw UFO information, as he says, then probably he did, I would, I would say. Um, it may serve uh, to be a, a highlighted case if he does get extradited to the United States. I would believe that it would cause so much of a stink that it would be rather sad to see Gary in, in an American jail, and he's certainly very frightened of the possibilities of the abuse that could take place in, in a normal jail or, or being tortured in somewhere like Guantanamo, which is, is a big fear for Gary um, that that could happen. But it would highlight the seriousness that the American authorities take to the UFO subject, and as it has, has been related to me by Larry Warren, um, a key, I, I can't, I, I shouldn't really name the, the person involved, I'm not, I don't think I've been given permission to reveal a very high-ranking legal uh, person in the United States uh, government, did tell Larry Warren when he had his, his uh, passport withdrawn that it wasn't to do with the fact that he was lecturing about um, the nuclear arms that were at the base where a UFO came down and was seen above the base in Bentwaters. It wasn't to do with the fact he was talking at lectures about nuclear weapons. It was to do with the UFO subject. That's why his passport was removed. And Peter Robbins, who's standing there now, I think knows more about this than anybody, but um, they take this stuff seriously. And when you start talking about UFOs, like with my own job, um, you get targeted, you know, you get targeted, you become a threat. And uh, using my position as an investigator in customs and excise, I had ability to use my credentials to, to look in things and ask questions and, and to get into military bases using my ID. You know, I was able, as a customs and excise officer, you actually have um, power over the military in the United Kingdom. I don't know how it works in the US, but in the United Kingdom, a customs and excise officer has official rank over a member of the military. So if you want to get into a military base and look around, you can do that. And I kind of, you know, abused my position a few times to kind of get some information um, that I was interested in. But generally, most of my research was done without needing to. But I think I was seen as a threat, and they got rid of me. And they got rid of me very unfairly for things I didn't do. Um, if, I'd, if I'd done them, I would have been, you know, happy to say, yeah, okay, I did that. But um, you know, it was computer related, something that people find very hard to understand. So they just threw up, Matthew Williams has done this on a computer. And, and it's like, well, I was asked to actually design something on a computer and I got, I got sacked for the fact that I designed it and put, put my icons on my desktop. If anybody can believe how s trivial this is, I put the icons on my desktop to access the system and I got sacked for putting the icons on my desktop for a system that I designed at their request. And that's how petty it gets, you know? They want you out, you're out. So, you, you know, you have to be careful with this stuff. So. Do you have time? Okay. I'll be very quick then, yeah, thanks. I, I just have a comment for, uh, hacking is a very common thing. It happens all the time. I work at a small college in Kansas. I'm, my name is David Cruz. And we have a process on our computer system that records data on those who are attempting to get in unauthorized. We get about 400 attempts per minute. Yeah, uh, trying to get in, and so it, it it is very common. Yes, hacking is very common, and um, some of the best hackers can actually erase those logs of um, their entry into the system. So, you know, once they get in, they can they can remove evidence that they've been there, as well. That's sometimes something they do. Peter, Matt, I just wanted to thank you for your discretion on that reference to that uh, American official. Yes, but I can put that on the record. That was former Attorney General Ramsey Clark who personally helped Larry and I re-secure his passport after it was suspended for quote unquote speaking out on sensitive defense issues in a public forum on foreign soil. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, that's all the time. I can answer your question outside. If anybody wants to come and speak to me, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so my name is Matthew Williams. Um, I, the introduction discussed a little bit about my background. Um, I was actually sacked from Customs and Excise because of my interest in UFOs. Um, I'm pretty glad that happened because uh, it freed me up to do a lot more research. So not everything negative um, like that, like being sacked because of your interest in a subject like UFOs has to be negative. Um, since that uh, time, I've managed to go on to do a lot more research into uh, UFOs and uh, digging out government documents, uh, some of which were in the British uh, government archives. And um, my interest in uh, crop circles has come to the fore as well, because I don't know if some of you are uh, aware, I uh, got arrested in 2000 for actually being one of the, the people that makes crop circles. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. It's a very... Uh, it's a very big subject, and if anybody wants to talk to me about that afterwards, I'll be happy to uh, discuss that with you. Um, so, my talk today is about Gary McKinnon. And Gary McKinnon is, uh, or has become very famous because of his arrest as being a, a hacker. Um, moreover, uh, somebody who was hacking, looking for UFO information. Um, it's already been discussed many times today, but uh, the Disclosure Project, which is um, something uh, spearheaded by Stephen Greer, where 200 or so very influential, very uh, uh, sort of well-qualified witnesses to the authority. Uh, Gary told me a lot of things that, that matched up with the type of character that Matthew Bevan was, insomuch that um, when he was at school, uh, he, he didn't do academically too well, but he seemed to have a great skill with computers. So it seemed like that um, some of this might have come from uh, his, his being bullied and being a bit of a loner. That um, he, he sort of focused himself on his, his passion and his interest with computers and excelled in that. But he wasn't interested in many of the, the, the courses and classes that school had to offer, which didn't really relate to things he was interested in. Um, so uh, he was originally born in Glasgow, uh, hence the name McKinnon being the family name, but uh, moved down to London when his uh, mother uh, sort of remarried, and uh, she came down with the stepfather, and uh, his, his um, stepfather was from Falkirk, which is quite near Bonnybridge, and as I said, um, his interest started when uh, he, he was a child, you know, sort of, you know, in his teenage years, about 14 years of age, um, because of his uh, father's UFO interest. Um, he was an, uh, an avid reader, so he'd read a lot of sci-fi. He was interested in Isaac Asimov and uh, uh, Harry Harrison books. And, you know, he had an interest in machinery, and he even d described himself as being interested in the military and uh, thought that he might even want to go in to be... Matthew Williams is a former investigator with the British government's Customs and Excise. After a personal UFO encounter in Wales in the early 1990s, he began to actively investigate the subject and focused his attention upon the links between secret government UFO projects and underground military bases in the UK. The former editor of Truth Seekers Review magazine, Williams has appeared on many British and overseas TV documentaries about UFOs. Please help us welcome Mr. Matthew Williams. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. One, two, three. Thank you. Just get, uh... Uh, track of what was going on with UFOs without having to spend a lot of money on hardback books. So. Um, going on from uh, there, I mean, he was basically, uh, I think we've got some slides here, so let's go on to number, 
the one. This is uh, Gary uh, when he got arrested outside Bow Street Magistrates' courts. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about his um, arrest and, and the hacking in a second. But um, uh, it's, a, it's fair to say Gary has a, a very strong, different-looking face. And he's been described as, as looking uh, like he's got a cat-like cat features. Uh, he has actually got quite strong bone structure to his face. And uh, it always kind of looks like he's smiling at you, you know, when you, when you sort of speak to him. So he's uh, an interesting looking character. Um, but I am very interested in meeting people and, and getting an idea of their character, you know, where they're coming from. Um, and I had some experience. Uh, I spoke in the very first Las Vegas conference um, about a gentleman who's since become one of my best friends um, called Matthew Bevan. Now, he's another UFO hacker, so I'm going to take you um, to a photo of him later on. But um, my involvement with Matthew Bevan has taught me a lot about the, the sort of counterculture of hacking. Um, hackers are not really uh, your average sort of people that um, have standard jobs, you know, sort of nine to five jobs. They, they tend to be sort of uh, underground figures that um, may be a little bit anti uh, UFO uh, happenings in the military. Uh, people who worked in the military, people who uh, had direct experience with UFO um, sort of reporting and uh, air traffic controllers, uh, not generally the types of people that you would um, want to dismiss or discount as perhaps uh, liars or, you know, people trying to gain some notoriety out of making up a story. These are very credible witnesses. Uh, 200 of them came together to actually state on the record that they had been involved in military projects to do with UFOs. Now, Gary McKinnon um, had had an interest in UFOs since it was dis disclosed by his father to him that he had actually seen a UFO and believed that he had uh, strange encounters with, in his dreams, it seemed, with um, extraterrestrials. And uh, Gary had kind of, since being a, a young lad, uh, this was in his teenage years, he was told this by his father, um, he, he sort of kept an interest in, in subjects of uh, UFOs. Uh, to the extent that, even though he hadn't read any books on UFOs, uh, because of what his father had told him, he decided to join the British UFO Research Association and um, he used to get their magazine newsletter. And he said that that was uh, the way that he, he got in first involved was he couldn't afford to buy books at that age. You know, he was um, on a small pocket money sort of status. And uh, joining the British UFO Research Association to him was one way of keeping 